Hi, this is Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Today we're going to be looking at this Oberheim OBXA. I've already rebuilt the power supply using my power supply rebuild kit, which freshens up the capacitors and beefs up the bridge rectifiers, and it's brought this OBXA back to life. I put a set of new key bushings on the key bed so everything is nice and smooth and, and quiet down there. And I'd like to be able to use this OBXA to calibrate a set of voice cards for a customer. But there is one little problem. In order to do that, I need all the keys working. And there's a range of keys on this key bed that is dead. So if I start here at low C, everything's working OK until I get up to about uh, G sharp here. And then this range of keys is dead until E. And then everything after that point works. So I know it's not the key contacts because I just refurbished the key bed and everything underneath the key bed looks great. So to track this problem down, it's really helpful to know how the synth reads the key bed. And even though the OBXA is going on 40 years old soon, uh, the way that it reads its key bed is still the way modern synths today read their key beds. The OBXA, like many modern synths, are controlled by a CPU. A CPU chip has a fixed number of pins. For example, the CPU used on the Oberheim OB series is this Z80 processor, which has 40 pins. So immediately we see that we can't just hook each key of the keyboard up to a pin of the CPU, because there's 61 keys on the keyboard and only 40 pins on the CPU. And even then, many of the CPU's pins are used for special features. The CPU communicates with other hardware in the system, primarily through its address bus and data bus. The Z80 has a 16-bit address space and an 8-bit data bus. So the way that we can efficiently check 61 keys is by having the CPU continually scan what's called a switch matrix. This is the schematic for the switch matrix of the key bed of the OBXA and the same for the other OBs. So you can see here the switches are labeled, one for each key. The switch is really just the J wire of the key bed, which makes contact with the bus bar. So when a key isn't pressed, you can see the J wire is not touching the bus bar, and it's an open switch, and there's no contact. When a key is pressed, the J wire touches the bus bar, and it's a closed switch, and there's electrical contact. The key switches are arranged into columns and rows. In this case, there's eight columns and eight rows, and the three positions we don't need for our 61 key key, key bed are just omitted from the matrix. The other thing we see on the switch matrix are diodes. Diodes are little semiconductor devices that allow current to flow, but only in one direction. The diodes are necessary in a switch matrix to prevent getting false readings due to switches closed in columns that aren't being scanned. So the way a switch matrix works is the CPU continually cycles through, applying a voltage to the columns, one at a time. Then it looks at each of the rows and sees which of them have the voltage present on them. And from that, it knows which keys in that column have been pressed. And it cycles through them all so quickly that you don't even know what's going on under the hood. So as a quick example, if you were to play a C chord uh, holding down C1, E1, and G1, it would be scanned in like this. First, the column 1 would be energized, and all the switches are open, so no voltage would be present on any of the rows. Then it moves to column two, and the only switch that's closed on this column is the one for C1. So that C1's row has a voltage present. Then it moves on to the next one, and it detects the switches closed at E1 and G1. Then it moves to the next column and all the subsequent ones and sees that, that all the switches are open there. And that's how using the 8-bit data bus and as few as 8 of the possible 65,000 addresses on the address bus, the OBXA and pretty much every synth since that era finds out what keys you're pressing. A similar approach to this is used to read what buttons you're pressing on the control panel of the synthesizer as well. So now that we know how the key bed works, going back to this particular OBXA, it's super obvious that we have a problem with the switch matrix because the range of dead keys here, these eight dead keys, exactly correspond to all the keys in the second column of our switch matrix. So there's a couple possibilities of our problem here. Either our problem is with the electronics on the control board. Uh, for example, the chip that turns on the columns of the switch matrix 
is bad and not turning on column 2. Or our problem is mechanical, that there's some connection physically broken in the switch matrix in the key bed. So let's start by making sure that everything is hooked up okay. I've still got the key bed unscrewed from when I did the bushings, so I can just prop it up like this to gain access to, to underneath it. And what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to see that the second column of the switch matrix is physically connected to the IC chip on the control board that powers that, that column. So this is the bottom of the OBXA key bed. And when I talk about the bus bar, I'm talking about this shiny bar of metal that runs across the bottom. And when you press the keys, they make contact with it. The OBXA actually doesn't have one bus bar. It has eight different bus bars. So you can see this little black thing is just kind of like a little guide, a little support that's holding these close to each other so they don't get bent out of place. But each of these pieces is an individual segment that's not touching the, the next one. And it's hooked up here to the control to the electronics board underneath with this wire and soldered into place. So um, here's the one for the second bus bar segment. So what we're going to do is we're going to hook our multimeter lead up here to the second bus bar, which is the second column of our switch matrix. So I've got my multimeter turned on, and I have it uh, ringing a tone when there's continuity. So you can hear there I'm touching the, uh, the other lead of the multimeter. What we're going to do is we're going to probe pin 2 of this IC chip down here. This is um, A21 on the lower control board. And this is the chip that actually powers that second bus bar. So we're going to make sure that they're physically connected as they should be. So here's pin 2 and I am not getting a beeping tone. So they're not physically connected and, and that's a problem. So now we need to figure out where this connection is broken. So I'm going to work my way back from the control board to the key bed. So the first place I'm going to check is the ribbon cable that connects the key bed to the control board. So uh, now I'm going to probe uh, looks like pin 1 should be column 2 of this cable. So I'm probing that again on continuity and I'm not getting a beeping tone. So the break is either on the cable or somewhere on the key bed. So let's continue following it back. So next place I'm going to check is the uh, cable itself. So I'm going to unplug this cable here. So I used an IC extractor to pull these cables out and uh, I advise doing that because uh, it's very easy to damage the cable if you try to pull it out by hand. So let's test continuity now between the bus bar and pin 1 of the socket. And no dice. So for reference, uh, the column 1 of the switch matrix should be connected to pin 16 of this connector. And, and uh, we see that it is. So maybe it's a bad solder joint connecting... Um, connecting the bus bar here to the uh, to the electronics board so this this solder joint here let's see if that's bad so here I'm touching the bus bar there I'm actually touching the wire that connects it to the electronics board and, and it's okay it's still good there uh, these little jumper wires here um, these correspond to each of the keys and these ones on the bottom the eight of them correspond to each of the um, columns so I can test it down here, and it's, it's good. So I have continuity between the bus bar and here, uh, and I lose at some point between here and the socket. So let's, let's confirm this. So here's column 2 and the socket, and uh, there's, there's no connection there. So the problem seems to be a broken connection somewhere on this circuit board, that's attached to the bottom of the key bed and uh, it's typically my luck that the problem is in the most pain in the butt place of the synthesizer to get to. So now I'm going to have to gain access to the underside of this board without bending the delicate little key contact wires. But I'd also like to avoid de uh, desoldering each of those eight bus bar segments. So before I take the key bed apart and take this circuit board off, I am going to try to wedge my soldering iron in and try to reflow 
these uh, two solder joints. This one here for the uh, that little wire, jumper wire for the second column. And then you can see it kind of comes down here and connects under there to pin one of that socket. So I'm going to try to wedge my iron in there and reflow those uh, those two, two joints and hopefully restore the continuity without having to take this circuit board off and, and do more drastic measures. So what I'm going to do before I hit it with the soldering iron is clean the area really well with some denatured alcohol. So I don't want any kind of dirt or junk on top of that, that solder joint. You can see it was pretty dirty under there. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a little bit of liquid flux over the solder joint. And that'll help it reflow nice and, and smoothly and easily. So now I'm going to go hit that with the soldering iron and then I'm going to test continuity again. So cleaning that up and reflowing the solder joints didn't fix the problem. But when I was down there, I noticed, and uh, if you follow this trace along, you'll see it. So this is the column two jumper wire. You come into this area. This area here, I cleaned it up a little bit. Uh, there was some corrosion on the circuit board. So this trace here on the keyboard electronics board is, uh, is damaged. So what we're going to wind up doing is we're going to solder a jumper here and connect it under here to the underside of that IC socket. So here's that jumper wire installed. I managed to uh, solder it in place without taking this circuit board off. And uh, now we'll flip it over and test continuity. All right, we're gonna have a look again between uh, the second segment of the bus bar, so column two, and pin one of the connector socket where it should be coming out. And now we have continuity. So uh, we fixed that broken column in the switch matrix. We'll put the key bed back in and test it out. All right, I've hooked back up the key bed and I'm ready to test it out. So the first eight keys before I'm working, and starting here, they weren't. So it looks like we fixed the problem. So uh, I was thinking, well, what would have what would have corroded that circuit board under there? And uh, the answer is, is something got spilled on the key bed at some point. And, um, and people spill stuff on their keyboards all the time. And uh, if they don't get cleaned out, uh, I guess it can corrode the electronics underneath and cause problems like this. So you gotta take good care of your stuff if you want it to, uh, to last a long time. So as we've seen today, not all dead keys are caused by bad key contacts. Hopefully you enjoyed learning how a synth scans a switch matrix to read its key bed. And I hope this video helps someone out there someday solve a problem with their synth's switch matrix. This has been Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.